Hello and welcome to the State of Politics. I'm your host, Declan McConville, and again, I'm delighted to be joined by my co-host, Patrick McGill. Patrick, how are you today? Fantastic. How are you, Declan? I'm good. I'm good. We've uh, got a wee bit of reason of restrictions, so again, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And our guest today, we are delighted to be joined by SNP MSP Colin Beatty. Colin, how are you doing? Doing extremely well, and uh, like everybody else, looking forward to a bit of easing of these restrictions. Great, great. So just to kick off, can you tell us a bit about yourself, a bit about your background and um, what you're up to just now? I know you're, you're going for Polyrood again for this 2021 election. Yeah, I mean, I've been a member of the SNP since uh, I was 14 years old. So, uh, you know, it's been a lifetime commitment. Having said that, I've also spent 23 years in the Middle and Far East in international banking. And uh, subsequent to that, I spent 11 years in London uh, working in the city. So it's been a long, circuitous road coming back to Scotland and ending up in politics. And uh, as you touched on, uh, I'm standing again for uh, election in Midlothian, North and Musselburgh. This will be my third uh, attempt or third election. Uh, the last twice, of course, I succeeded. And indeed, between 2011 and 2016, I, I doubled, my, doubled my majority here. And just a wee bit there that uh, perhaps not many people pick up is that I was also five years a, a local councillor in Midlothian. So it's been a, a long journey. You see, you've been a member of the party for uh, 14 years, Colin. No, since uh, I was 14. Oh, yes. Sorry, since you were 14. Yes, of course. Um, what has it been like watching the rise of the party and then, then eventually being elected, uh, being part of a majority government and been an MSP for 10 years? Well, it's a very different party now from when I paid my two bob and joined up. Um, in those days, it was more a movement. You only had one policy, and that was independence. Now, over the years, particularly the last 20, 30 years, the party's sort of trans transmogrified itself into a, into a more sophisticated and pretty efficient political machine, uh, which I would never have seen when I was 14. So uh, for me, it's been a huge thing to see and seeing its impact in Scottish politics. Uh, standing again for the third time for Midlothian North and Musselburgh, um, I am quite excited about it actually because uh, uh, I think there's huge things happening now in Scotland. I mean, it's a, it's a seismic revolution going on round about us, and I think a lot of people are aware of that. So this next Parliament is going to really be one that's going to be a, a, a life changer for all of us in Scotland, either for the better which I hope, or for the worse, which of course I don't hope. I think Colin, since uh, Holyrood was established 22 years ago, um, we've saw transformation as a country. This is probably the most important election of all our lifetimes. What do you think has been the key success to the SNP in those 22 years of becoming the party in the fringes to now the party of government? Well, I think uh, our, probably our major asset has been the First Minister. Um, she's done an absolutely fantastic job as uh, uh, sort of heading the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, and dealing with that. And I think that's really brought across the strength of her leadership and her abilities still to be able to empathise with, with ordinary people that are going through it all. I mean, we're all going through a terrible time. And we at least like to think that uh, our politicians know that and, and, and care about it. And I think that's hugely what's come across uh, from, uh, from our leadership. But on the, on the other front, there's lots of other things happening that have been good. I mean, education, for example, it's actually come on by leaps and bounds. I mean, if you look at things like the attainment gap that's been massively shrunk over the years, it's just it's just night and day. We're in a different world. We can't even remember what it was like pre the Scottish Parliament or even pre SNP government when things were 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 just just sitting there doing nothing, just just festering. And now we have the excitement of we've got control of these things. We're able to influence them. We're able to get things done as we want them, and it's succeeding. Health service, our health service has managed to raise itself fantastically to deal with the pandemic uh, to, that we're facing now. They're doing a fantastic job. 
courageous men and women in the front line who have been fighting this virus. And at the same time, somehow managing to keep the NHS ticking over for emergencies and other cases that are coming in. And, you know, this is this is just shows what a fantastic asset the NHS is. And if I can just say that down south, uh, there seems to be a, a view in London that the NHS should be available for sale as part of this uh, a Atlantic trade deal with America. And I'm, I'm absolutely against that. And I know every single person I speak to in the SNP is against that. It's, it, that we have an asset, we have a, we have a gem in our crown here and we want to hand it over to somebody else. Why, why would we do that? And I hear that there's uh, also 37 doctor surgeries being privatized or at least passed across to an American investor down in London. Now, doctor surgeries, as you know, are independent contractors. They're not actually part of the NHS. So the, the danger is that this could expand and more and more surgeries effectively are taken into private control. That's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, we've got a national health service that the whole world envies and, and, and would like to have. Why, why would we hand it across to private investors uh, potentially to mess it up because all they're interested in is ripping the profit out of it. You know, it doesn't make sense. But so we've got health, we've got education, we've we've got uh, reform of the police force, reform of the fire brigade. Things that should have been done decades ago have been getting handled. The tough jobs have been getting handled and handled successfully. I mean, for goodness' sake, crime is down forty five percent over the last twenty five years. What's not to like about that? Why is that a bad thing? You know, so I could go on, but I'd bore you stiff. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all. Um, you're saying there about the NHS. Uh, obviously, with uh, the Scottish Parliament, uh, that's protected. I know there's a there's a complication with the funding with the Barnet formula, but that's protected as long as the Scottish government don't want to sort of sell it off into private hands. Uh, how, how much well, of I that? Wish that was the case, but in fact. Uh, Westminster can at any time overrule that. And uh, down, in, down, in Westminster, when they, down in Westminster, when, 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 when they were passing legislation, the Scottish government tried, at least the Scottish M MSPs, the MPs, the uh, SNP MPs, tried to pass a, an amendment to the Act uh, in order to protect the NHS. The majority Tory government voted that down. So we're in a position that at any time the UK government can intervene and make sure that the Scottish NHS is up for grabs as well. Yeah, of course, we can make it difficult for them. But at the end of the day, we can't stop them because what you have to remember is every single act that we pass, every single bill, bill that comes to the Scottish Parliament can be overruled by a UK government minister. Now, that is not settled devolution. So we've got a long way to go on this, but don't think that the NHS isn't vulnerable. It is. That leads me on nicely to the question. Um, do you think the NHS is then best protected with independence? As you were saying, it's, it's more protected under devolution, but as you say, the UK government, especially with a Tory majority, can tamper with it. Yeah, they can ride roughshod over it. I mean, I think the only way to protect the NHS is independence, because with independence... We can make the decisions. And somehow I don't think there'll be many people in Scotland voting to privatise the NHS. I definitely agree. You, you spoke there, Colin, about Tory power grabs um, in the news yesterday. We saw that the, the Conservative Party are going to take the Scottish Government to the Supreme Court on what is a very, very, you know, I really don't understand that a bill that is the protection of a child, UN conventional rights, been taken to the Supreme Court. Do you think that shows that the contrast in tone between both governments at this moment in time? I think there's a very different philosophy and culture between the government in London and the government in Edinburgh. And there's no doubt about that. Um, this question of uh, whether we take on the, whether we incorporate the children, UN children's rights into legislation, it should be a no brainer. Why wouldn't we? You know, just think about it. Why wouldn't we? What's the reason for refusing? It, it just doesn't make sense. And to me, it just seems it's another example of the UK 
government flexing its muscles and trying to knock devolution on the head because they are trying to erode devolution. Uh, yes, um, you say that the, the UK government are taking the Scottish government to court over this. Um, I think Mike Russell in January said that if they do not grant a Section 30 order for another referendum, then the SNP would uh, sort of carry on a bill for another referendum and see if the UK government challenges it. How do you see that scenario playing out if that was to arise after the pandemic? Well, I think that... Uh after the pandemic, I think, uh, yes, I think that's the obvious way to go. I mean, I, I personally think that if we get our majority in the Scottish Parliament, the SNP majority, perhaps backed by a number of Green M MSPs as well, uh, I think that uh, that will put a whole lot of pressure on London that they don't feel they have at the moment. The, the difficulty is they have to come up with reasons why not, not just we're not going to do it. You know, that's, that's not sustainable. They've got an international audience as well, which uh, I don't think they take enough uh, cognizance of. But if they turn around and say no, and they could, they could, if they're daft enough down there, to be quite frank, then we should continue on and let them challenge us. Let them challenge us. Let them take us to court, because it's by no means certain that they would win. And anyway, you have to understand if the people of Scotland have a settled will for independence, it will happen. It will happen. The pressure will make it happen. We don't. We don't. We don't. We don't need to worry too much about uh, uh, London sending troops up anymore. They haven't got any. <laughs> <laughs> you are saying there about the international community and how the world is watching the UK government and how they act. How important do you think the international community is when you're talking about a? Uh, sort of the democratic legitimacy of the UK, when if a majority, a sustained majority, support independence and the UK government don't even allow a vote on it? I think that puts a huge pressure on London's credibility. We have, we have a large stock of goodwill, particularly in Europe, where people, I think, have come round to understanding what we are trying to deal with internally here. In 2014, when the referendum took place, I don't think that was clear. I don't think there was the same support from Europe. They didn't understand. But now, having seen the whole Brexit process and the shambles that's been made of that, I think, there's, I think Europe very much understands that. And certainly people I've spoken to are very positive about welcoming Scotland back. And in fact, there's been motions in the European Parliament uh, from a large number of M MEPs suggesting that Scotland should be fast-tracked back into the EU uh, when, the time, when the appropriate time comes. Now, we can't tell exactly what will happen uh, post-independence, but I'm pretty sure we'll be back in the EU fairly quickly and as quickly as the EU can succeed in, in, in pulling it in. As far as uh, other international partners are concerned, like the United States and so on, I think, I think there is a realisation that... There is, a need, there is a need to recognise democratic aspirations. Otherwise, the democratic countries themselves around the world become lessened if they willingly watch another country being, a, well, I'll use the term, oppressed in, in a, democratically. And I don't think it's sustainable. I just don't think it's sustainable. You cannot, you cannot rule a country that does not give its consent to be ruled. It has to be done by consent, not by force of law or force of arms or any other force. It has to be by consent. And if the consent no longer exists, then the union no longer exists. I think, Colin, that was something we seen last year in the US elections. And it was a worry because we've seen a country that had voted democratically, expressed its will for change, and we had a, a president who was trying to, as you used the terminology, oppress that. So I think there can be lessons learned from then when people try and change the will of the people. While we're talking about the constitutional question, you, you've mentioned your background in finances. What do you say to people who say that Scotland can't afford to become independent? Because with your knowledge and expertise, of years in the financial industry. Well, what is your counter-argument to people that make that 
that suggestion? Well, there's, there's two simple arguments. The first is, if you're telling me that after 300 years of union, the union dividend, the union benefit has been that Scotland is a basket case financially, then clearly that union has failed and needs to be uh, cut as quickly as possible so that Scotland can recover. On the other side, uh, we get constant bad news pumped out about uh, this huge internal deficit. But again, that, when you actually analyse that huge internal deficit, the large part of it is the allocation of UK government debt. Now, I would contend that a lot of that UK government debt should not be Scotland's debt, although we are charged for it. For example, uh, Crossrail down in London, which I think is now up to about £16 billion, it's a national project. We have to pay a proportion of that, 8.5% or whatever it is. Is that fair? HS2, goodness knows what that's going to cost. And the last figures I saw were in the 30 billions. So we have to pay part of that. Now, none of these projects are coming anyplace close, close to Scotland. They're no benefit to Scotland, but they're classified as national projects. And we all have to chip in. And yet, strangely, when the fourth bridge was built, it wasn't a national project, and Scotland had to dig into its own pockets and pay for it itself. So you can see that there's huge anomalies here about where the national debt is being incurred and what it's being spent on. I'll give you also the London Olympics. I think they were about 12 billion. We paid our share of that. Did we get any benefit out of that? Don't think, don't think many business people up here would, uh, would agree. So there's a huge argument on that side. Scotland's productivity levels are approximately the same as those in England which means they're less than Europe, so they still have to improve. But we are, we are the same productivity levels as, uh, as the rest of the UK. So that's encouraging. We also have uh, the, the, the positive feature of a balance of payment surplus. Now, goodness knows what it's like after Brexit, but it was previously running at about three or four billion pounds a year. That's pretty solid stuff. So we can pay our way in the world, but we've got a budget deficit. But we don't know we've got a budget deficit. I mean, I sit in the, the uh, Public Audit Committee in the Parliament, and we've interrogated uh, HMRC and the National Audit Office about, uh, for example, Scottish rate of income tax. Now, you think it would be very simple allocating income tax to Scotland because that's, that's something that's been devolved to us that we get that, that money. Now, we don't collect it. They tell us how much it is, and they give it to us. Now, the deep suspicion I've got, seeing how they've been doing this, is that the figures are wrong. There's all sorts of errors. There's, there's, for example, all the people working in the North Sea in the Scottish zone are excluded. So their taxes are classified as being part of the UK tax take. There's all sorts of anomalies with different companies that work across the border that don't seem to be able to uh, give an accurate figure. And a lot of it is guesswork. And they say it's guesswork. They admit it's guesswork. They're projections, they're estimates, they're guesses. This is not the way to run a country's finances. And it's not the way to justify whether we're uh, solvent or not solvent or, 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 or anything. It's just daft. So all these figures are actually fairly meaningless. And until we get the levers into our hands, understand what our tax take is, then... We have no idea what that deficit really is. It certainly won't be more than the unionists say it is, that's for sure, because they will have maximised whatever, whatever they can. I'm suspecting it's an awful lot less, and that if our negotiators are any good at negotiating the terms of the separation from England, the financial separation, that is, then I think that, uh, I think that we should find ourselves in an awful lot better situation. But also... Independence will bring opportunities that we don't have now. I mean, independence is not going to make us rich overnight, but it brings the opportunities to do things our way, to do things a bit differently. Small countries are better at reacting and turning and changing and pivoting in terms of their economic activities and, and economic directions. Big, big countries are like ocean liners that take a long time to turn. 
But like Holland, Belgium, and some of, some of the other smaller European countries, we can be swift on our feet. We can be fast on our feet. And that's what we have to be. And if you look at the, the small countries in Europe, they're, they are the most prosperous of all the countries in Europe. And that's what we have to be. We need to bring everybody up to a good prosperous level and we can do it. We have the abilities, we've got the people, we've got the skills, you know, we're not daft. And uh, we have a good, we have a good solid democratic population. We're well educated and skilled. And, uh, you know, I have no fears at all. I've seen what's happened in overseas countries. I've seen how they prospered. Why can't we do the same? Why can't we be allowed to do the same? We have to be. You were saying there uh, about productivity and about your work on the uh, committee, the two committees that you're on. Um, productivity has stalled a bit since the 2008 financial crisis. We're now hopefully coming out of another crisis. Uh, would you like to see a, sort of, a different economic approach to the one of the last 13 or so years to sort of boost productivity and sort of try and help the uh, most vulnerable in society? Well, I think the biggest problem we've had is that we've been going through an extended period of uh, austerity. And the austerity, of course, has brought in after the 2008 financial crisis in order to repay the spending great money that was borrowed to bail out the banks. Now, because of that, our public services have not expanded in the way they should have. We've not been able to do an awful lot of things that we should be able to do. Um, local authorities in Scotland, well, they have been ring-fenced to a large extent, certainly need more money. Uh, in England, uh, a lot of the local authorities have had cuts of up to 40%. 40%. Can you imagine what that must be doing to local services? We've never had that in Scotland. The Scottish government has protected local government in a way that they never did down south. Now, we are suffering from a shortage of public funding in key areas. Never, never mind COVID-19. That's a that's a, a one-off issue, and the funding for that will eventually eventually uh, reduce and go away. There's areas within our communities where we know that we need to invest. We still have too many people who are on low salaries, and I'm talking about people who are who have jobs, full-time jobs, but they don't pay enough to live on. Now, this is scandalous. If you've got a private company paying somebody not enough money to live on, that means that you and me, taxpayers, have to step in and top this person up, whether it's by means of, of uh, giving them a rent uh, uh, benefits, whether it's council tax benefits, all sorts of money we are spending in these, on these companies. So these companies are paying dividends to their shareholders on the back of uneconomic wages for workers. Now that has to, that can't go on forever. It has to change, which may mean we have to pay a wee bit more here and there for some of the services. But if we can get to the point where these people are paying tax, that means that they're up at a level where they can actually live on their salaries, then they're making a contribution to, to, to the public purse, but also means that the public purse isn't having to subsidize them and that money can be transferred elsewhere and used elsewhere to the benefit of the communities that we're trying to support. Because we still have areas of terrible poverty in Scotland. There's still work to be done. There's been huge amounts done, but there's always more. You know, when I look at the statistic, for example, where 24% of Scottish kids go to bed hungry every night, how is that acceptable? Now, the Scottish government has stepped in and, and given free school meals to P1 to 3. And that's going to that's going to be extended up now to all primary kids. Plus, they're going to get breakfast. Now, that may seem quite extreme in a way to be doing that, but we know that unless we can reach out to those uh, families who are struggling, and by by you know, no kid can learn if it's hungry. So you need to provide the means to feed them. And you know, in a democracy, in a, in a, a compassionate country like Scotland, you know, Scotland is a phenomenally compassionate country compared to many. We need to be able to reach out to these people and pull them back and get them on track. You know, the Victorians 
were fairly simplistic in a lot of what they did. And one of the things that they firmly believed in that was that education was the best way out of poverty. Do you know something? It still is. An educated population in Scotland is the best thing for the prosperity of this country and for the prosperity of the individuals in this country. And we need to, we need to make sure that happens. And I, I'm so pleased that a lot of the things that we're doing are moving in that direction. I wouldn't you like to see that back. You were saying about uh, private companies not paying uh, workers enough to support themselves, never mind their families. Does it frustrate you that the Scottish Parliament doesn't have the power to uh, enforce a living wage and a national minimum living wage because those powers are restricted to Westminster? It's enormously frustrating because these are basic, basic tools that would make such a big difference. Now, I recognise you couldn't just come in sweeping overnight and bang everybody's wages up and so on. That, that would create chaos in the market. But you could do it over a period of years, you know, until you reach that point. Like most good things, you do it in stages so that there's no um, disruption elsewhere within the economy or the financial system. But you get to your goal within a fixed time. And that's what we need to get to. We can't even fix a time for it because unless we get the powers, it's all a pointless conversation. But yes, I would like to see the living wage at a considerably higher level than it is now. Colin, you spoke about young people in, in Scotland and um, the reason which the Scottish Government have diverged from UK policy on it. At this point of recording, we don't have party manifestos, but so far we've had some announcements on the SNP pledging to free tuition, as you've already mentioned, um, preschool meals being extended with the baby box uh, introduction and that carrying on. How important do you think these policies that really do target young people and children are important as Scotland continues to, to move on? And how important do you think those policies are, even in the playgrounds? And I know there's going to be a major investment into that. How important do you think that is to your community itself and Scotland as a whole? Well, I represent a very mixed community. There's certainly very wealthy areas, but there's an awful lot of areas that are, if you like, post-industrial. They previously were mining areas, and they are very mixed in the, in the uh, in, in where they stand. I think that in the aggregate, all these little things, like the baby box and so on, like the child benefit that we've introduced, put them all together, and they become a fairly substantial package that gives a huge support where it needs to be. I mean, look at the situation there in England on tuition fees, which you mentioned, and I'm thinking mainly of universities here. Their kids leave, leave university with a huge debt hanging around their neck. Is that the way to start your life? Is that the way you should start your life? Um, we, you know, here in Scotland, the tuition at university is free, as it should be as it should be. And I just cannot understand the logic in starting our kids off in life. We want to give our kids the best start in life. And the best start is not starting them with tens of thousands of pounds of debt that they've got to repay. Because, you know, very few university uh, leavers start at massive salaries. So it's going to take them years to pay it off. It's a millstone. And you ask people, well, why haven't you bought a house? Why haven't you got a mortgage? <laughs> check, check out the student loans, you know? It's, it's, it's a millstone around people's necks. So I strongly believe that uh, youngsters should not be lumbered with debt. We want to educate our population. We pay as a society for these people to be educated and to give them the best start in life. Why? Because that's good for us. I want somebody out there earning a good salary, paying good taxes, to pay my pension. So, you know, it benefits all of us. Uh, you're saying there about um, free tuition, uh, extending free school meals to up to primary seven. Uh, obviously, as Declan said, there's no manifestos out at the minute. But over the next five years, what would you say are your most exciting uh, pieces of legislation that you're most looking forward to passing to try and improve the lives of people in Scotland? Well, the first one will be the referendum and the uh, the vote for independence, of course. 
Uh, I think that's the key thing to getting people back on track and 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 creating prosperity across our communities. Uh, it'll break us free, you know. Yeah, we'll make mistakes like every other country, but there'll be our mistakes. You know, we won't be able to point at uh, London and say, ah, you did this or that. It'll be our mistakes. But the most, most important prop thing is that we will have the opportunities to get it right. And we will get it right. And we will make this a prosperous country. I mean, that that, that is the big ticket legislation that really I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to. If you talk about legislation in other areas, well, I think... To a large extent, we've got to wait for the manifesto to come out to know what the big ticket uh, uh, decisions are going to be. But I'd be surprised if there wasn't things covering health and education, which are key areas for all of us. Um, and, you know, the National Health Service is wonderful, but you have to keep it tip top, right up to right up to speed. And, uh, you know, I would acknowledge that during the, the COVID-19, there's been delays in people's operations and you know the routine stuff, we have to catch up. I hope that there'll be indications, stronger indications coming out as to how that's going to happen, because we do need to catch up on the cataract operations, the knee operations, the things that are affecting uh, the vast majority of our uh, population at any given time. Uh, and I know the SNP is going to be building specialist centers to try and expedite this. And that's a big ticket thing when you think about it. You know, we're going to have specialist areas that are only going to deal in the day-to-day -day things that most of us at some point will need, like a new knee, a new hip, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I see a lot of pointers as to where we're going. And, uh, you know, I think, I, th I think really this, this parliament is going to be exciting. Colin, in terms of the recovery post-COVID-19, do you think Scotland could bounce back quicker than the rest of the UK? Are, are, as England as an isolated country within the UK, do you think Scotland could bounce back quicker just to the way our system works and the way, as you say, we react to stuff with a devolved parliament? Well, we react quickly in areas that we have control. Mm. Um, we're still at uh, Westminster's apron strings and their economic policies and so on will, will drive us because you understand that if they decide to spend money on the NHS, more money, then we get a percentage if they don't spend it on the NHS, we get nothing. So it makes it very difficult for us to actually plan how to develop these hugely important areas. But even so, even within that, you know, the government's got a lot of uh, leeway as to what it can do. And uh, I'm pretty confident that, uh, that uh, subject to funding, which is always a question, whether the Tories will go back to their austerity or like they did in 2008, and start cutting back. Um, <clears throat> for example, this last year, they cut back on our capital expenditure, our capital budget. So it can always be unexpected. You never know what they're going to do. And un you know, indecision, unexpected changes to funding, that's not good for a government because you need to, you're planning not for a year, not for, not for three years, you plan for 20 years. That's if you're any good as a government. Um, so I think that uh, economic recovery could be good or it could be patchy. It depends what Westminster does. It depends how they handle our funding. You know, and it's daft. We're sitting here. We've got all these ideas. We've got all these things that we could do and achieve. And we're sitting waiting to see, will London decide to fund their activities so that we can fund ours or will they not? It's, it's uh, you know, just daft. Definitely. Uh, you're saying there about Westminster economic policy. Uh, the man in charge of that is Rishi Sunak. Um, there's reports out in the past day or two that uh, Boris Johnson is under pressure to pay 190 million, I think it is, for a royal yacht after the passing of Prince Philip. Uh, I think there's been tens of billions of pounds wasted on uh, uh, Miss Harding's uh, uh, track and trace system down in England. How frustrating is it when you hear people like Theresa May say that there isn't a magic money tree, but then there's countless amounts of money wasted on these uh, Tory projects? Oh, the, 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 there's been uh, IT projects down in England for the HMRC, for example, which I think cost about £3 billion, and it was dumped. 
Uh, there's a recent one for about 200 million, and I can't remember which one it was, and it was dumped. I mean, these are eye-watering sums of money. And as for spending 190 million pounds on another r royal yacht, I don't think this is the time to do it. And to be honest, Give me 190 million pounds to spend in Scotland, and my gosh, I could make a heck of a difference to an awful lot of people's lives. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's how it's got to be looked at. If we were awash with money and didn't know what to spend it on, yeah, go and, go and build another yacht or whatever. But we're not in that state now. Money is going to be tight, and it's going to be tighter in the future. We've got huge debts that we've uh, mainly incurred down south of the border. And, uh, you know, as I say, give me 190 million pounds and see what I can do with it. Colin Wilber, well, on the, the, the subject of the, the Tories and finances, we've, we've saw reports in recent days of former Prime Minister David Cameron getting into a bit of a, a muddle for lobbying um, with Greensill. How, how disappointing is it for you to still see things like this go on due to the, the, the former power of a Prime Minister in London? And it just seems... I think to anybody, like an old chums act, we've already seen Matt Hancock um, being kind of found out for his PPE contracts to one of his neighbours. Now we have the former Prime Minister practically pulling the strings of Downing Street. You know, what does this say about the UK as a country? Well, I think uh, the mother, so-called Mother of Parliaments is in deep trouble. Um, one of the issues is, for me personally, I guess I'm a politician, so what any other politician does in the UK reflects on me, reflects on all of us. It reflects on the whole institution, the whole, the whole body, the whole vocation that are in politics. Now, I know from my, my time in the Scottish Parliament that the, the vast majority of MSPs of all political parties are trying to do the best for their country. Uh, whatever their ideology, they're, trying to do the, they, they're doing what they believe is best for their country. To have to watch what's happening down in London, where, as you touched on, PPE contracts and so on are being dished out to, uh, to rather dubious uh, partners, and there seems to be no accountability and no willingness, worse, no willingness for there to be an accountability, is shocking and worrying. I mean, the trouble is, once this starts, it starts to permeate everything. It starts to infect everything and if one person gets away with it then the next person says well I can get away with that he did this I can do that as well and so it goes on until the whole thing just becomes a rotten mess and that's what I fear if they were wise they would set up some sort of a, a commission to investigate all these things and to bring back a degree of rectitude into parliament a, de a degree of rigour on how contracts are handled and what ministers and prime ministers and members of parliament are allowed to do in terms of their, uh, in terms of their uh, powers to, to, to hand out contracts. Here in Scotland, it's much more open. I mean, for example, I, I run an office, I spend money on that office. Every single receipt that I have ends up online so people can see what I'm spending my money on. And it's public money. Why, why would I worry about that? You know, it's, it, in a way, it protects me because there can be no comeback. There can be no sly innuendos that, uh, you know, my Caribbean holiday was paid for by my, <laughs> my office account. <laughs> so it protects me. Um, and I know a lot of other MSPs feel the same. And yet, if you're in London, you get dished out wadges of money that you've barely got to account for, even as an ordinary MP. And I know that most MPs are absolutely rigidly correct in this, and they stick to, stick to the rules, written or unwritten. But there is a small number that clearly do not. And there has to be a way of penalising them. There has to be a way of picking them up. There has to be a way of identifying them and some sort of restitution and maybe retribution. So I think, I think it should be tough if, if something irregular is found out, perhaps more so because you're abusing public trust and public trust is pretty fragile. 
And I don't think the Westminster government's got a high degree of public trust. Holyrood, on the other hand, I think still has. And it's a local parliament. And for goodness sake, if I'm down in London, you're not going to get many constituents coming down to London to, to beat in my door. But goodness, here in, here in Edinburgh, five or six miles away from me, if I, if I was doing something grossly wrong, there'd be a mob down there from my constituency. And uh, rightly so. And that's democracy. That's why local is better. You know, because I walk down the streets there and people tackle me. I go to the supermarket and it's like a, it's like a rolling surgery. And, you know, yeah, my wife never sends me for groceries anymore. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's just a different attitude and way of life. Uh, I went to one of the local cafes, a Turkish chap, and uh, he's a great supporter. And uh, he said to me, you know, in Turkey, this just wouldn't happen. He said, you wouldn't get an MSP walking into a cafe. He said, they would have at least three gunmen with them to protect them, maybe more. And, you know, I walked out and I thought, thank goodness for the kind of democracy we've got here, that, I, that I'm free to walk around, that it's safe to do so. And also that it's safe for constituents to come and speak to me without having gunmen standing around me, you know? It's, it's, it seems an unbelievable situation that other countries have, but we should cherish and, 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 and protect that liberty that we do have to do these things, that we can, as MP, MSPs, just walk into cafes and have a coffee and a chat with some of the folks, and that nobody feels intimidated in walking up to you and stopping you on the street. That's good democracy. And that's the kind of democracy we have to keep developing here in Scotland, the kind of democracy we have to protect here in Scotland. 100%. And um, you're saying there about the openness and also how local the parliament is. It certainly feels a lot closer to me than London does. It's only about 45 minutes on a train. Um, even the building was designed to sort of look open. There's a lot of windows and you can see in from the outside. Um, what is the uh, legislative process in the Parliament? How long does a, a bill take to pass? You're on two committees. What is it like scrutinising legislation? And uh, who's involved in the policy making process? I guess the big, I guess the how complex the bill is will dictate how long it will take to get through, and also whether it's got uh, government support. Government support really is essential to getting a bill through although private members' bills do, do appear. Um, the committee system in uh, Scotland is very much uh, similar to the House of Lords, the activity of the House of Lords. It is, a it is if you like, the scrutiny chamber, cross-party scrutiny chamber. And by and large, it works quite well. Um, while there can be political disagreements, generally on committee, people are cooperative and do try to get the best out of the system. So you find that cross-party cooperation, individual MSPs participating, that's a really positive thing and a good thing about democracy here in Scotland. Whether there's an argument for a, a formal second chamber at some point, I don't know. That, that, uh, I'd like to see the, a bit more facts on that one. But some, if a bill comes forward from the government, for example, it will go to the committee first. Now, I, I'm on the Public Audit Committee, which does not scrutinize bills. But I'm also on the uh, economy committee, which does. And uh, the bill will come to the, to the committee. The committee will scrutinize the bill. It will then call for witnesses. And we will ask people who are experts in whatever the bill's for. Let's say it's about energy. We would pull in energy companies, maybe local councils, people who are, people who are involved in energy production in any shape or form. And we would discuss the bill with them. We'd try and understand it. We might get legal people in until we have thoroughly, thoroughly in our own minds understood that bill. We will then make a recommendation. And that recommendation usually is unanimous. It's rare for it not to be. Uh, and we will usually say that we, we basically say the bill, the bill should go forward for a hearing. That doesn't mean to say that that's the bill being passed. It's just that the committee, if you like, has got no objections. 
So the bill, so that's stage one. Stage two, it'll come back to the committee, and there there has to be votes. There there will be votes, um, and there'll be amendments that have been put in by different political parties or individuals, and we will vote on them. And at the end of the day, the bill will be passed or not passed, basically. It then goes for stage three in the parliament, where anybody can come in and make changes to it, amendments, propose amendments, and uh, that's uh, that's the final stage of the bill. And once it's through stage three, uh, it becomes law at a future date, and it goes to London for the Queen to sign off. So it sounds fairly simple, but it can take months for the for the subject committee to investigate to go through all the aspects of that bill and what the implications are. And people are genuinely trying to understand whether there could be some unexpected knock-on effect, something that maybe we just, that, that the people drawing it up just didn't think about. And that's where we, if you like, we are that independent view of it. We are that independent second chamber, if you like, that, uh, that goes through it and very effectively and very thoroughly. I think the system broadly works. I think it does. You can always improve the system, of course, but I think I think as it stands, it, uh, it does its job. Just quickly, um, on the, the writing up of a bill, um, it's obviously not Nicola Sturgeon writing all the laws. Uh, who are the people that sort of begin that process? Is it lawyers or is it sort of parliamentary assistants? Who are the people who write the legislation? Well, the actual writing of the legislation is done by what they call the bill clerks. Uh, and that covers a multitude of people uh, who are involved in putting the bill together. It will have to go through legal scrutiny. So by the time the bill comes to the minister, if the minister, if you like, says, I want a bill that does this, assuming it's a government bill, the clerks will go off. They'll engage with all the different civil services and so on. They'll come together with a draft. It then gets scrutinised by the minister and his staff. And if it's felt to be robust enough and appropriate, it'll go forward to the committee and the process starts. But there are experts in this that draw the bill up because, you know, the one thing you don't want is legislation that uh, can be ambiguous or that maybe impinges on other legislation in unexpected ways. So you get a knock-on effect on something else. That's unprofessional. And uh, that's what the civil servants, who are experts in this, are there to ensure doesn't happen. Calling on committees, um, the most high-profile committees, was Nicola Sturgeon appearing in front of one and we spoke earlier on about transparency. Do you think that, that shows the difference between our parliament and Westminster that the First Minister of Scotland's willing to sit there for, I think it was around eight hours she sat there. And on the other point of that, that committee specifically, how do you think we maybe move away from a system that committees can can become a bit partisan? Um, because at times, you know, we've seen in committees that other parties may team up with one another. How do we kind of take that element away from, from committees? Because I think they're, they're good, but at times, you know, they can be a bit partisan. Well, first of all, talking about uh, Nicola Sturgeon spending eight hours in front of a committee, yeah, you wouldn't get Boris Johnson doing that, that's for sure. Um, it does show a difference in our approach in Scotland. And, uh, you know, I think it shows that no matter how senior a politician you are, you have to be humble enough to accept that you're still accountable and still have to uh, respond to Parliament and, in the broad sense, to public opinion. Now, that particular committee, in my opinion, was fairly partisan, and uh, it, was, it was never going to be anything else from the way it was put together. Um, in some ways, I would have preferred if it had been an independent committee, but that would have been also quite difficult to achieve, uh, given what was being investigated, which is really the processes of the parliament and how they got to where they got to. Um, and I think that, uh, yes, I think I think we did quite well in terms of uh, showing the better democratic credentials that we have here in Scotland. The whole hoo-ha about it at the end uh, 
was extremely unfortunate, but I do think it was written in the stars that that was going to happen anyway, right from the moment that committee first sat. Uh, but I don't think that should detract from the fact that the actual subject committees, this is a special committee, the actual subject committees like the education committee, the economy committee and such like, they can be partisan in terms of bringing their own ideology to play on aspects of a bill. But there is an understanding, I think, between the different MSPs, an acceptance that we have to work together. And people will be a little bit flexible. There'll be a little bit of a bit of sugar room there. They will negotiate, they will discuss, and we'll come to a formula generally that everybody expects. It's quite rare, as I said, for there to be dissent because we find formulas that work. And that's what, that's what politics is all about. It's about negotiation. It's about compromise. And it's about getting something that everybody can get behind. And that's not the politics we have in London. There is a reason why in London they face each other two sword lengths away uh, between the opposition and the government. Uh, and that's a it's a rather old tradition of parliament there that's much more confrontational. And some of the scenes there, it's it's barbaric. I mean, they are they are disgraceful. We never have that in Scotland. Um, and I think perhaps a piece of that is psychologically, we are sitting there, all of us facing the presiding officer. We're in a half circle. We are not facing each other. We're not in a confrontational mode. And yes, there's a bit of to and fro, and especially at uh, First Minister's questions, which is, has descended, unfortunately, into a bit of a circus uh, as it stands. But I think that the whole tone of it is different. We rarely get the sort of abuse thrown about the chamber that they do in London. And I'm pleased about that. And I think also there is a better... Prob higher probability here that if you did that in the chamber, you know something, some of my constituents would be getting in touch with me and saying, hey, what are you doing? You know, this, this isn't what we want to see in Parliament. People here are willing to contact you locally. They're willing to express their opinions and they're not slow to do it. So I think we have a wee bit of a built-in protection from going too extreme on this uh, up here in Scotland. I wouldn't want to see the scenes that they have down in London. It's 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 absolute disgrace, and I think it's uh, indicative of where the whole institution's going. Unless somebody comes in and is really prepared to grasp it, grasp the nettle, and uh, reform it, including abolishing the House of Lords. By the way, definitely. Um, you were saying there about the sort of partisan committee that was investigating the handling of harassment complaints. You yourself were on two committees, and you also had a, held a position in the SNP for several years. Um, we've also spoken about how busy ministers can be scrutinising legislation and then also representing their constituency. Do you think Holyrood has enough MSPs with the amount of work that uh, everyone has, the workload? of MSPs, would you like to see a sort of bigger chamber? I think the reality is yes. The public would say there's enough of you, but uh, the reality is yes, because as more powers come to Scotland, we need more subject committees, we need more MSPs to perform these important scrutiny responsibilities. And once we become independent and we have defence, foreign affairs and all those other responsibilities. There's going to be more ministers, there's going to be more cabinet secretaries to cover these areas, which will mean there is a, a dwindling band of backbenchers who are going to be filling these committees. So if they're not careful, they'll end up with committees with about three people on them. So I think, yes, at some point, they're going to have to consider whether they need more MSPs simply in order to ensure that the business of the, the parliament's carried out. I mean, we've already got a situation where the smaller uh, political parties, the Greens and the Lib Dems, they can't possibly cover all the committees that they would like to. So they have to prioritise. So they actually are not part of quite a number of committees, uh, which is unfortunate because, you know, 
getting the diverse diverse views of other politicians in, some of them very experienced, can be helpful. But we don't have that. And I fear that if we don't get more MSPs at some point, then we may end up not having enough bodies physically to actually do the job. Either that or it's going to be 14-hour days. <laughs> Colin, just finally for me, after the 6ME, what would your vision be of Scotland in the next five years? Where would you like to see the country going? Ah. Well, I think there's going to be an extended period. Well, we will get a referendum, obviously, and I'm hoping that referendum will be possible this year, subject to the pandemic, of course. Um, but then comes fairly lengthy negotiations. And best guess I've got is it'll take two or three years because it's an extremely complex business dismantling the joint forms of government, the taxation system, and so forth, so that we know and understand what is ours and what resources that we have to use in this country. But, in, but within that five years, I'm hoping that we will be back inside the EU and that we will be have a new relationship with the rest of the UK and hopefully a more positive one because I feel that sometimes it's got a bit combative between us and uh, you know I regret that uh, we've got a great deal in common with the rest of the UK um, and we have, all have relatives down south and they have relatives up here so hopefully there'll be freedom of movement between our countries there will be a continuation of the cultural exchanges and people people going down and visiting their relatives and all the rest of it. So all of that I'd like to see within that five-year period being achieved so that at the end of the five years, we've got a, a stable, comfortable relationship with everybody around about us and we have our own country back and we're able to start doing the things that we need to do. And, uh, you know, my goodness, we've got a lot to do. As I said before, it'll be so exciting doing it ourselves for our own people and uh, able to achieve so much like other small countries in Europe. It's a, it's something to look forward to. 100% Colin, and just finally for me, uh, the SNP are uh, advocating both votes SNP and you're obviously standing again for your constituency. What would be your message to voters and why the both votes SNP message is important? Well, I think it's hugely important. Um, in 2011, the SNP got probably just about almost as many votes on the list as they got in the constituencies. And the result was that we got extra MSPs on the list, which gave us a majority in the Scottish Parliament. 2016, it went the other way, and we got less votes on the list. The result was that we did not get a majority in the Scottish Parliament, it's as simple as that. The, the, a lot of the people that are saying vote for other political parties are basing it on 2016 and the projections from 2016, but every election is different. Now, if we don't do as well as we hope we're gonna do in the constituencies and the list vote is split, we could end up with a very, very minority government and not a prospect of independence. And I think that would be disappointing for an awful lot of people. So the only way to be sure is to vote in the constituency for the MSP so we can maximise our, our uh, votes there and achieve as much as possible. And the second vote on the list for the, for the SNP in order that we can ensure we maximise the number of list MSPs. There's, apart from the Greens, there's no other political party that at the moment is projected as being capable of uh, achieving any MSPs. However, uh, what they do have is the prospect of just splitting those few percent off our vote that can mean the difference between the SNP getting list MSPs and not. So it's, it's, very, it's, 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 it's a very interesting situation. I'll be watching it very carefully. I should say, as a constituency MSP, I was also entitled to stand on the list, and I took the, the decision not to stand on the list as well, quite simply, um, I think if you put your faith in your ability to win the constituency, that's where you should focus. Yeah. And Paul, we'd, we'd both like to thank you for, for joining us today and uh, we wish you all the very best for the 6th of May. 
thank you very much, and uh, it's been a pleasure being here. And uh, I've enjoyed the I've enjoyed the last hour. Thank you for coming on, Colin. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye.